Okay, we're sitting, hi everybody, we're sitting here at the Feather Pipe Ranch in Helena, Montana, and we're having a reunion of uh, the class of 1970 and 71. 69. And 69, and sitting here with me to my far left is Bruce Bradbury, who I met in Poo the Party in 1970, and Wendell Field, who I met in Poo the Party in 1970, and just here is <clears throat> Robert Conger, who was there in 1970, and Martin Stamp, who was there in 1970. So we were all there, and um, it was a wonderful time. We had a lot of good times and, and um, hard times, too, but um, I thought it'd be nice if everyone could share their experiences. So, um, Bruce. <laughs> Bruce, why don't you tell us some of your... You wrote Love Is My Form, which Swami's adopted as his theme song and has sung to thousands of people all over, you know, in Puda Party and all over. So why don't you tell us about that time? What I remember? Yeah, what you remember. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, one day we were in an interview. Yeah. Let's look at the camera. Uh, Michelle. Oh, Michelle. look at Michelle. <laughs> oh, we were in, a, in an interview and he happened to say that. And I, I actually don't remember whether he wrote it down or whether I think one of us wrote it down, and I'm not even sure. I doubt I had the presence. Um, and then I just went back because we'd been singing bhajan, because he'd asked us to sing bhajans um, back in Whitefield. And I thought he was just joking, because I just thought he was joking, but I remember Gil, who was a member there, was like very strict about the fact that um, as Swami said we had to do it, we had to do it. So um, we went to Puda Party and sang bhajans, which I thought was sort of absurd because none of us could sing and none of us <laughs> knew any bhajans. <laughs> but, um, we learned anyway. So, um, no, it was just um, putting it to some music and we s hacked around for a while and took it in and sang it. We and uh, I must say Didn't that... we practice it, We practiced it. Yeah, practice oh, it? we all practiced for, for a bunch. <laughs> and, uh, and it was split into harmonies that didn't work <laughs> and all sorts of things and I was back a couple of years ago and and he sang it and the tune's been changed and it's been cleaned up and spiffed up quite a bit I mean it's recognizable but that's about it exciting huh could you sing the original version uh no yeah. actually <laughs> yeah, we, <laughs> we could I've, sing it I've unfortunately lost my voice <laughs> in the intervening years oh, come on but I, I actually when we've gone around or something, I have a story that I could tell, but Good. it's not that. Well, tell. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, tell it. Oh, I'll try to keep it short, but it, it's how yeah. I ended up there, which I often think about. In, in 69, I was living in a cave uh, in, on Crete, um, which seemed like a, a logical thing to do. And I came across some sort of small article about a man named Sai Baba who was in India and had... Uh, there were some instances of him healing people, and I was pretty fascinated by it, but I had a very negative impression of India, and I never had wanted to go there. So um, the day after I came across that article, it was sort of going around in my mind, and I got caught in a rainstorm, and I jumped under an overturned fishing boat, and there was someone there from a Scandinavian country who was a drug dealer who ran back and forth between New Delhi all the time and started talking to me about it and how easy it would be to get there. and. So he drew me a complete map of how to get from Crete to New Delhi and on $70. And I thought that was really exciting because I had $300. So I thought, well, I could do that and, and even get back home. So um, I got up the next day and I took off for India and traveled across um, by various means. And when I got to New Delhi, I went to the map survey office because I had the name of the village Party. And I asked them in Delhi where this village was and they went through books and books and stacks of maps. And they told me no such village existed. <laughs> so, but it, then, to my surprise, India was really quite a quite a neat place. So it didn't trouble me too much. I thought this is great. I'll just go have a good time. But I went up to Rishikesh and looked at what some swamis were doing, and I thought it was all a bunch of crap. And I was really glad that I didn't get caught up in the religious scene, and I could just run around and enjoy architecture and things like that. So after about six months, I think I was exhausted by India, and I took off to Ceylon. And uh, on the boat to Ceylon, as I got on the boat, um, I saw this man who glowed, and I can't uh, describe it in any other way. It was um, some Western guy, and he just glowed, and I spent the whole very journey over to Ceylon trying to get up the nerve to come up to some, what do you say? Like, hi, you glow? <laughs> I, I didn't have a clue what to say. 
And finally we docked in Salon. So many people got off the boat, I lost track of him and I had been too afraid to talk to him. And that was that. So I traveled around Salon for a while, was down in a tiny town on a beach when a man, a uh, local came up to me and said, don't stay in a hotel, come stay in my house. Um, my wife cooks and you'll like it much better. So I said, okay. And I went to this man's little uh, cottage um, in town and I walked through the door and in his living room was the guy who glowed. So I thought I better not blow it twice. So I just looked at the guy who glowed and I said, why do you glow? And he said, I just saw someone who changed my life. And I knew right then what he was talking about. And he said, his name's such a Sai Baba and he lives in Buddha Party. So I go, oh, where's that? <laughs> so he drew me a map. And uh, I just got up the next day and, and went to boot party. So that's how I finally got to there. To get a glow, and you still have the glow. <laughs> oh, still got the glow. I, I was out in the sun all afternoon. <laughs> Do you know the name of the fellow who glowed? No, no, he was just a fellow who glowed. And, just uh, the glow man. So that's it. Good things. How about Wendell? Well. Wendell, you have many I can stories. go on and on. Well, but, uh, start with something. Start with something. Well. I heard the, all the ladies talking yesterday about all of their experiences, and it reminded me of how, reminded me of how, to me, he was always like a, he had, he played many roles. He could, the one everyone wanted to see was father of the universe, know all, see all, you know, what your uncle in Hoboken was doing at the moment. But around him, when you were around him intimately or in the same room and stayed in the same room a lot, he was like very motherly and very... Like a child, he always loved to. He loved to have things happen in a game and then in the play. If you were too fro, if you if you got in the same room and you froze, which many people did, then it was like he had to just like talk at you. But if you were involved in the play and you had a quick response, then what he said made more sense and actually was like you know, and it was a a wonderful drama, wonderful play. So anyway, what what should I talk about? What well, I just some any outstanding. Well, I know what huh. experience oh, yeah. you stayed okay, well, in. Okay, well, I house. actually lived in his house. Now that's pretty unusual because I, I, you know, I don't know how many people, even to this day, have actually could say they stayed in his house. But in his house, and Roger Reddy, who was at that time was his valet and was his really personal attendant, didn't seem to know any more about him than anyone else. Even though he was around him all day, he was. You never met anyone that was immediately closer to you. He was immediately your best friend and your lover, mother, father, brother, sister. But at the same time, he seemed like maybe he's not exactly human, you know, it's not, it's hard to <coughs> pinpoint. Um, some of the times that I remember, and I really cherish in my mind, or when he would be funny or he'd be playing a joke on you, one time staying in his house, and I'd been there for a month or so, and they were talking about going somewhere, I thought. They were talking to Telugu, which I didn't really understand. But So the evening came around, and he said, uh, about 6 o'clock, and he said, go out and get in the car. And I did, and we, he got in the back seat. I got in the back seat, Roger Reddy, and a driver, who I can't remember his name. You remember the driver's name, the young kid? Morley. Morley, yeah. And uh, we drove out the gates, and this was quite a rush, you know, just sitting in the car, but then passing waves of people, you know, <laughs> bowing as you went by, and we were driving along. And uh, he said, uh, where's your luggage? And I said, uh, I didn't bring any luggage. And he said, oh. And he's like leaning out, he kind of looking out the window, mumbling ready-made clothes and toothbrush. And, blah, blah. <laughs> and then he's driving along a little farther, and he says, this is not the road to Madras. This, there's no signs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the Roger Reddy and the other guys, they said nothing. They were just driving along. And, <laughs> and he says, ah, this is not the road to Madras. Turn around and go back. So we turned around and we drove back partially, a few, few miles. And we, what we were really doing was looking for a big pile of sand to have a picnic in. And uh, there were, I, I think the Richard Bach filmed this. He was in the car behind. Indra Devi, I think, was there. There were just like, maybe eight people all together when we, when we first got there. We sat down, we had some food, he pulled things out of the sand. It was a full moon, I remember, and there was like a crystal necklace, crystal mala, which was in the full moon was like real spectacular because each little thing kind of <laughs> flickered like this. And within 20 minutes there were 
300 people. I mean, it just kind of like appeared out of the night. And I always thought that was amazing around him, that he could not be somewhere. He would leave. He would show up, say, at Whitefield. No one knew he was, what he was doing. And immediately there were 500 people within a minute or within an hour. Minor miracles. Here's one I thought last night. Minor miracles of Sai Baba. The fact he didn't trip over his own clothes. Yeah. Did anyone ever think of that? I mean, w could you walk around with this thing hanging around on the ground? I mean, you take five steps and, you know, you'd be on your face. Uh, <laughs> the fact that the Vibhuti doesn't fall to the ground, you know, before it's, like, let go. Oh, anyway. Um, well, what, what did he pull out of the sand besides the... Well, I don't recall. I mean, I mean he I've just... seen him materialize so many things, I don't remember. <laughs> that day. I think there was a... He was talking about how similar... Indra Devi was living in Mexico. How similar Mexico was to India. And how the... He materialized a little statue of Durga or something. And said how similar this was to the image of... Like sort of a Christian... Christianized Indian... Christianized image... South American image of of Mary riding on a jaguar, which was a local, local deity oh. in, uh, I don't know where, in Probably Mexico. in the Mayan or the Mayan, Aztec yeah. culture. The ones that really kept their own. Sort yeah. of. But anyway, that was, I don't recall, really. And then you got to paint the murals at well, yeah, yeah. college. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that story. It's to show how, how mysteriously it seemed to work with me. We were all going from, uh, he was going from Brenda, or uh, put the party to Whitefield. So we were all going to get a taxi, you know, and go down to Whitefield. And he said at the Darshan line at noon, before we were all going to leave, no, you go with these two guys. And uh, two guys took me the other direction to a town called Anantapur, about 120 miles, maybe. And they dropped me off at a college he was building, which was barely started, really. It was a little bit there. And then he came by later that day, and walked around and didn't really say much to me and left. And so I stayed there overnight on the ground and looked around a while and then decided, well, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but I'll go back to Whitefield. <laughs> and I went back to Whitefield and I was sitting outside the next day and he walks up and says, uh, bring that picture and come in. And I knew what he was not talking about, it was a little painting I had done. So I took the painting and went inside and had lunch with him and he talked to the, about the painting to some other people in Telugu or Tamil. And I spent the whole day and had a great time. And then I went, we were living in Whitefield, I think. I think we had like six or seven people living in Whitefield, which was about a mile away, really. And um, the next day I was sitting outside under a tree, kind of out of the way. And he walked up out of the way and I can't <laughs> mimic this, but it, and maybe this doesn't come across when you're talking a lot of times. The thing is what, is, what he's saying is one thing, but what's actually happening is like hitting you on several different levels. And he looked off in space and said, you don't even care. And it was like a knife. <laughs> it was like a lover. It was like very, you know, it, it hit me very hard. You know, it was a very touching thing. And what I took it to mean and what I suppose it meant was that I was supposed to be staying in his house. Now, he never said that directly, and I just walked in the house and spent the next month there. <laughs> so, so that'll show you how it kind of, you know, it's a little difficult to describe. But uh, so I was supposed to do, I found out I was supposed to do these paintings, and I worked up my drawings and went up and painted only at night because it was construction going on. So when you painted on an at Anantapur College, you had one light bulb, a 100-watt light bulb. Tell us about that. Well, because they were working all, and running up and down the stairs all day, I couldn't do anything in the daytime, and because of bad electrical work, at one point, actually, I was trying to help a guy pull a cable, and I took a hold of one spot and went... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't let go of it, I was like going... So, I, but all I had was one 100-watt bulb, and then someone took my red paint for some reason, <laughs> with to put dots or what, I don't know. <laughs> but, so that created a problem, but, I, but it was... I had a wonderful time, really. I, I ate nothing, I worked all night. And Baba would come up there and, and hang out maybe once a week, once every two weeks and then once, once a week. And when he was there, then I was with him real, you know, all the time. In fact, he sat with me in a, in a sand pile for like 15 minutes, just me, and talked to me one time. 
What did he well, say? <laughs> tell. I, I don't know. I won't tell him. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, I, at that time, I asked him if he was coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. And he said, clean up your own house before you go next door and clean up someone else's. And then he said, I asked him if he's going to have gray hair. Because to me, whenever I was very close with him, he glowed blue or black sometimes. But he was a kind of a blue light. So a guy with blue light, who was a blue light with white hair and an orange robe, I thought was kind of... <laughs> it was hard to relate to him on some levels as a human already. This was like a little too much. Um, he said, oh, what can I do? What can I do? And, uh, but anyway, he still doesn't have gray white hair. So, But anyway... The, the thing there, as it went on, it was supposed to open in 10 days, and the building was half done, I thought. And 10,000 people showed up, the Baba devotees, and they started doing something. And I don't know who, no one seemed to really be in control or what they were doing, but it started to come together. And I was getting very, very intensely overcome, really, and sort of falling into trance states. and really couldn't even do much, really. I was kind of just in a trance for a while. And as the day went on and on, or came closer and closer in the last two or three days, I had basically just was sitting and kind of filled with light. And I remember he gave a speech. There were lots of people, 100,000 people. He gave a speech, and as he was talking, I walked inside the building. It was, it was outside. And was leaning on a post in ecstasy. And... Uh, he walked in after we finished his speech and they closed the gates and there were only like 10 people in. But he walked right up to me, came right up to me face to face and said, yes. <laughs> and um, I went right over on my face. I didn't feel like I did anything, but I went right on my face and sort of boing, boing like this <laughs> in my mind or in my own experience that just was like doing nothing. But then I felt ill. It seemed after all of my strongest experiences, I felt ill with hepatitis and took a while to uh, after going back to, to uh, put the party I hadn't seen him maybe for a month and I after getting hepatitis I was staying in the hospital there and I decided that when he was going to come by you know the darshan the first time I went down to darshan that I was just going to sit there and I wasn't going to like get caught up and sucked in you know when he came by and get all you know, oh yeah and do this <laughs> and so no matter what happened I was going to maintain my center and I was going to just be here and I was still it was very it felt very high and very filled with light and I was sitting there with my eyes open and he comes walking by and he goes mm. oh, I should do it to the camera mm. <laughs> ding <laughs> and sticks a piece of rock candy right in front of my face. And of course, I had to reach up and take it. <laughs> so, curses well again, but uh, I'll stop there. I mean, I could go on and on and on, so you don't want to get me started. Yeah, we do. How about Mike? How about Mike? Hi, well, uh, what happened? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I went to India on my way to Australia from England. And my basic plan was to get as far away from my family as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't like what I heard about India. But I got there and slowly, I got sick first of all, of course, but they healed me. Uh, and slowly I got more and more involved with spiritual things. I got more attracted to the Hindu ideas. Uh, and I was traveling around and I was reading, reading Ramakrishna and Vivekananda and stuff like that. And then one day in a small town just uh, east of Bombay, I went into a temple and there's this dude, a uh, big picture of this fellow with this amazing hair. And I said, who's that? And they said, Sai Baba, he's really fantastic. He does miracles. I said, yeah, but when did he die? <laughs> and this, hey, this guy's alive? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was really excited about that. And the, the, the priest I was talking to said, well, you get on this train, you travel for two days to Bangalore, and then you travel for another day on the bus. And I, I, I said, oh. <laughs> No, I've got a few places I'd like to see along the way. Just I like just traveling slowly, slowly. And so I traveled. I went down near Goa and I hung out in a few other places, met someone called Yuji Krishnamurti, which was an interesting experience. And then three months later, I got to the ashram. And the first morning, I went there in Darshan, and he walks across the veranda, as he did every morning, to go to his breakfast. And he looked down at me and said, what took you so long? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so, 
I, I didn't know what to make of this. Uh, the only other Westerner there at that time was, was Gil Locke, and uh, he was very strong in his uh, sadhana, and I didn't know what to make of that. And uh, then in the first day, he came running up to me and said, hey, hey, Sai Baba wants to interview you. And I thought, hmm, well, you know, do I want to interview him? <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, sure. Anyway, I, I, I went into the interview room, and rest is history, really. <laughs> I stayed. Um, I actually left the ashram for three months to go to Ceylon, and then I came back and stayed, stayed a year. Uh, and for me, that was the most formative experience of my life. And what I really liked was Sai Baba and the group of people and the way we got hysterical together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was great. And the way Baba would pull us up and lop us off uh, and then pull us up and lop us off again as if we didn't learn the first time. Of course not. <laughs> and the exquisiteness with which he told us it was time to go or allowed us to stay or just uh, taught us lessons. And I can't pass that on. He can. He's the guru. Uh, but it was uh, an amazing year. Uh, can you think of words that he said to you and what your feelings were? None that I can really share. Uh, I remember one time when we, uh, <coughs> before a festival, he got us all to paint these tombstones, these rock blocks. Before about, Dasra festival. Before, before Dasra. Yeah. About five feet by two feet, and we painted uh, Sai words on them. And I found this very hard. <laughs> uh, I'm not an artist like <laughs> some, some of my, my brothers. Uh, and uh, he came in every day and he talked to us and uh, it was great, but it was still really hard. Uh, well, that was an amazing, amazing time. Uh, you. Mr. Robert? Mm -hmm. Mr. Howard. Huh? Remember, I, I've already been on camera for, I already told him how he I came. Sorry, you guys. Speak a little louder. So when Baba came back, I came to the white field and I was there the morning he came out and he walked down the path and he was on the women's side. The women sat one side and the men the other side. And he looked over at me. He stopped and he looked at me in the eyes. And I had two experiences. One was, it was like looking into eternity. And I looked in his eyes many times since then. I've never had the same experience like looking into just, you know, Anantam Brahma, a boundless God. And the other one was I, I knew that he knew me. I knew. In the afternoon he came out and he walked up to me and he smiled down at me and then he lit over and he whispered in this ear. He whispered, tomorrow. So the man who was sitting next to me said, oh, tomorrow Baba will give you an interview. And so the next day morning waited, no interview, afternoon, no interview. And I thought, well, what's going on? So I went back to the house where I was staying and I was sitting in the white field and I was sitting on the floor in a room and I had a picture of Baba and I was looking in his eyes. And um, at a certain point, the sun was behind the window so that it made a ray of light which came down and made a circle in the bottom of the picture. And I, for some reason, stopped looking in his eyes and started looking in the circle of light and I began to see things. The first thing I saw were mountains with a building of some kind made out of the same material, no trees, never seen them in this lifetime. A river, sand banks, grass in the sand. And then I was high above the ocean and I saw this little speck in the ocean and I didn't, it was just a speck in the blue water everywhere. And then I got closer to it and it was moving and I could see it was moving and there was a white wake and it was a boat of some kind. And then I got closer and closer and I could see it was a fishing boat. And I got close enough that I could see the colors, gray and white, and I could see two people. One was standing up on the side and one was sitting in the back steering and they both had something black on their heads. 
And I knew then it was my mom and my dad in their fishing boat. And I hadn't seen the fishing boat yet. They bought it after I left. And I hadn't seen the hats they wore until I went home and painted their boat, but that was them. And what came to my mind was, this must be the yogic power I've seen far away. <laughs> but it's, yeah, I, I, a friend gave me a crystal ball and I've been looking for it ever since. <laughs> uh, second time Baba said tomorrow, I was in the same house, this time no interview, Baba, I had put his picture on the wall. I was trying to really meditate for the first time. I'd never been a meditator, although looking back I'd had meditative experiences, but not sitting straight. So I was trying to sit straight and I was trying to cross my legs. And I began to get pain in my legs and my back. And after a while, the pain just continually, gradually got worse and worse to almost cramping. And I thought, and people were saying how they were meditating two hours, four hours. And I thought, I am not going to do this for four hours, for sure. And uh, all of a sudden, the pain turned to the sweetest pleasure you can imagine, just beautiful pleasure in my back and my legs. And what came to me was, when I was a child, I read how the lions would tear the Christians to pieces in the arenas in Rome, and the Christians would be smiling and peaceful. And I couldn't believe that. I mean, I couldn't, didn't seem possible. And when I was sitting there, I thought perhaps God gave them. And later, when I read in his love's book of questions, and he said, why did Jesus and Pralada suffer for you? Baba's answer was, Pralada did not suffer. Third time he said tomorrow. This time he called us all in for an interview. And I think it was our first one as a group, but I'm not sure. And we were there, and he was sitting in his chair, and I was sitting with my back against the door, and he was sitting opposite, and he was talking to us. And I was just looking, and his arms were down like this, and I was looking at him like I'm looking at you. And all of a sudden, I saw many arms coming out of his body, many hands, and I saw eyes between his fingers looking out. And I thought, he wants us to be his hands and his eyes. And later I read in his books, speeches, I want you to be my officers and soldiers in fighting the war against unrighteousness. And I want you to be my engineers and workmen in again building the bridge to God. And my fa one of my favorites, uh, make yourself into a flute through which God can play his music. Fourth time Baba said tomorrow, and this was the one, the final hook in, the, in my trip. <laughs> Uh, I, in Goa, I had met a Japanese monk. He had studied with a Vietnamese Buddhist master. When his master died, he wandered around Southeast Asia looking for saints. Heard about a woman saint in Cambodia. Went to the village, asked her son if he could visit her. I'm making this story a little short. Son, if he could visit her. Son went inside, meditated, came out, said, my mother says you can come, walk in that direction. She'll guide you. He walked for about two hours, got to a clearing with a house, not a little hut, knocked on the door. She was there. Uh, he went in. She said she'd make him tea. He said, I have to go to the bathroom. In French, to me, je veux pisser. And uh, she said, go ahead. And he walked out, and there was a big tiger in the clearing. And he ran back in the house, and he put his arms against the door, and he said, Madame, <laughs> there's a tiger out there. And she said, I know. And I asked him, did you, did you go to the bathroom? And he said, no, not then. But anyway, he stayed with her for three days. And every night at dusk, these wild animals would come. I mean wild. The animals would come. And she would walk among them and touch them, pet them, and talk to them. And that's been a dream that since I was a kid, that's, I mean, swim with the dolphins, everything. And so I really wanted that experience, and I have, still have her name and address someplace. But by the time I was ready to go there, there was war. So my last time, I was already working in Baba's garden, and I take a nap every day, and I lived too far away at the time to, it just seemed too far to walk in the hot sun and come back. So I lay down to take my nap. I had my, lay down on the mat, my head was down like this, my arms were at my side, and my feet were pointing straight down like this. And I was just getting ready to go to sleep, and I felt something pick up one of my feet and put it on its side, 
and then put it down very gently. And then pick up one of my feet, put it on the side. So it was actually more comfortable from, from my sleep. I didn't know what was going on. All I knew was gentle as a baby. Then something began to clean the bottom of my feet. I still didn't know what was going on. But then I had shorts on at the time. I wouldn't wear shorts again, <laughs> but I was so innocent. So I had shorts on, and something began to look in the hairs of my leg, and then I knew, monkey. Then one of them came and did my arm molia, and then another one climbed on my back and did the back of my hair. And the last thing before, someone came with a big smile and said they were afraid that he was going to hurt me, which the smile contradicted, but it was... The last thing is a little monkey came around, walked around my head, and came up, and he kissed me on the cheek. And that was uh, the fourth time. And looking back, uh, not only did Baba show me his power, but he... Uh, he sh I think he showed me that he knew that I really wanted to experience that in Cambodia and, then, and that I wasn't going to be able to. So I didn't leave. I didn't leave. And I thought I'd never leave, but then when the time came to leave, I did and I've and, uh, been happy ever since. I'll tell a garden story since I used to work in this garden inside the gates. Uh, to get away from you guys. <laughs> well, it didn't work if you're right here. I just saw a lot of weeds. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I'll, I'll just tell a story. One day I was uh, pulling weeds uh, in this circle around a fountain that wasn't running. And um, there were a couple of monkeys that were fighting uh, nearby, as well as... The monkeys were wonderful, but they were also a problem because they would eat certain flowers as soon as they'd start opening up. So I was sort of loved the monkeys and hated the monkeys. But anyway, there were two of them fighting nearby, and I saw Baba's feet in his robe standing next to me, and I looked up at him, and he said, uh, see these monkeys fighting in season for a reason. He says, today, man, fighting, 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 no season, no reason. He said, of all the things God made, each thing, by being true to itself, contributes to the harmony of the universe. He said, of all the things God made, only one has gone off his path, and that is man. So I put that one over, the, over time with a couple of other sayings, which were uh, um, the one about man being sub-animal, animal, human, or divine. And instead of put them all together, help me a little bit. Again, I already told a long story, so I'll let Howard talk next. Well, I was recalling Anantapur College um, and thinking of Wendell on the scaffolding. And back in 1971, and, and just for people that don't know, the first college that Swami ever built was for women in 1971 in Anantapur district, which was the uh, sort of district seat of. Um, where for the party villages, it's uh, like a county, I guess it would be in America. And um, one day, it's big. it's big, it's a big district. And um, Michelle and um, Benno from Germany and I, we, we decided to go over to Anantapur and, and volunteer. And um, so we were working every day, painting doors and windows. And, and every evening, Swami would call different groups of volunteers. This was around the time when about thousands of volunteers showed up in the last 10 days to get the, the college ready because um, it was going to be a big festival and, and the president of India was coming to open the college. And So every evening we would shower and get dressed and get ready because we thought maybe Swami's going to call us in this night. But one night I worked very, very late. I was painting this door into one of the rooms and I just wanted to finish it. You know, I was just so close. So. I was all full of paint and turpentine and sweat and I was smelly and as I was running across the inside courtyard, it was a round building, some volunteer went like this, come, come, Swami wants you. And so they brought me into this room and there was a lot of volunteers and I had really bad dysentery because the food and the water wasn't very good there. <laughs> so I sat down at Swami's feet. And Swami, to me, was just glowing. He was sitting against this stark white wall, and I could see this aura of light around him. And he, he leaned over and he said, how is your stomach, sir? And I said, Swami, my stomach is very bad. He said, yes, yes, I know. Food is not very good here. And 
he apologized for the food and he was very sorry for the accommodations and what could he do, you know. And then he waved his hand and he made me some vabuti. And I ate the vabuti and then just immediately started to feel better and, and the dysentery stopped completely. And it, it lasted the rest of the 10 days, but when I got back to put a party, <laughs> came right back. So he just kept me healthy so I could finish the job. <laughs> oh, Bruce has yes. more stories. Well, actually, that one that's connected that I've been thinking of, and to me, I always remember it. it it's just something that, it's a very small, but to me, it was a very touching thing. Um, stayed with me all my life, and I, I think I was known or remembered as the dysentery kid. <laughs> we all had our bouts with it. I was having a really tough time, so this might not be the most elegant story, but um, some festival came up. I don't even remember what, but the situation was uh, Swami was standing up on a dais, and surrounding him in a complete sea were several thousand people, and we had our ordained seats in the place on the ground so we had been taken in fairly early and we were sitting there just uh, things are incredibly crowded uh, they space people as closely together as they possibly can and so we were sitting in and surrounded by thousands of people outside with absolutely no place to move and in this instance there were no corridors or whatever it was just a sea of people and so I was up there giving a discourse and I realized I was going to have an attack of dysentery. I mean, a really horrible attack of dysentery. <laughs> and there was absolutely no place to go. There was no way to get out um, because the people were just packed in and they were miles behind me. And it was so close to being overwhelming that I knew if I stood up, I... <laughs> <laughs> it was the most horrible moment in my life when she had like these these little thin pieces of cotton cloth around us. <laughs> I was just dying a thousand deaths. I mean, uh, my life was like passing before my eyes. And, and, and Swami s stopped speaking, and he stepped down off the dais, and he started just like walking through the crowd. And when he walked through a very tight crowd, it would always part just enough to let him through, like he'd form his own little river. And uh, and I was quite away from a ways away from the dais, and he just sort of like ambled around, but he didn't like stop and do anything, just kept walking and walking, and he walked like right up to me, and he looked me in the eye, and he reached down and made some fubuti and put it in my hand and said go, and when he's everybody saw him tell me to go, so like this river just like opened up <laughs> and I went like <laughs> running out and I remember I was so euphoric I mean I just couldn't I mean when Swami comes out and there are thousands mm. of people there you always know there are thousands of people who like have their own heartbreaks and needs and passions and everybody wants to talk to him everyone wants attention and I mean I just figured there were people who would need things so much more desperately than I even though I was about ready to die of embarrassment that's all that was going to kill me and just the act of kindness to come rescue a single person who was like that desperate and to be able to sense it in a crowd of thousands of people and do it. And then, of course, then the ending is so typical of, of what happened there, which is, of course, by the time I got out of the crowd, I was euphoric. I mean, I was absolutely euphoric. And I immediately ate the vabuti and was sure that, like, I would be you know, cured. Well, no, then I had my dysentery attack right then and there. And as soon as I ate the babuti, I was, I was out of sight of the crowd, but it was still, it was just like horribly embarrassing. And I, I remained um, horribly ill until I finally, gave, somebody said, why don't you go see a doctor? You know, and I thought that was like cheating, but I, I did. And I went and saw a doctor and got some medicine and got well and lived happily ever after. <laughs> so, anyway, but that's one thing I remember. It's going to be hard to forget. Well, he saved you from a, a, a oh, absolutely. terrible embarrassment. Absolutely. In front of and, most and yet, like, didn't cure me, which is just so typical of what happened there and why it's so hard to explain mm -hmm. when people say, you know, like, well, what was it like there? Or what happened? Or what does he mean to you? It's just a really difficult story because it's always more complex than anyone would have ever imagined in any sort of fairy tale image you have of being there. And what will happen to when you there really isn't. I don't think it's not what happened to me. I don't know if anyone's fairy tales came true. <laughs> oh, you. <yeah. laughs> I think anyway, on a certain on a certain level, level, yeah. But because I guess I didn't have any expectations really. I didn't have. A, I wasn't looking for a, a prince on a white horse or something exactly. Mm. But 
Well, Howard had some great stories last night, which we can't show. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I could tell. Christmas Day of 1971, Swami finally, <laughs> you know, the day that he resurrected Walter Cohn, we had an interview, and in the private interview, Swami said to me, I had traveled all around India and had a lot of problems with my visa already. And Swami said, the reason why you had so much difficulty with your visa is because you traveled around India. He said, you traveled all in the, over India and you had no proper address. He said, if you always give, he said, now always give my address and you'll never have any more difficulties. So I said, but Swami, if I give your address, they'll ask for a letter from you. So he said, yes, yes, I'll give. <laughs> so... I came back to India and um, I went back to America for three or four months because Swami had told me to go see, go for three months and see my parents and come back. And when I came back on a three-month tourist visa, when the three months were up, I asked Swami for a letter. Uh, I, was, I was preparing in my mind that I'm going to ask Swami for a letter for my visa, you know, for an, a long-term extension because I wanted to stay there the rest of my life. I never wanted to leave. And I was about to ask Swami, and one day I was sitting in my room in Kadgodi village, just behind Brindavan, and the police came knocking at my door at 8 o'clock in the morning. And they had this notice from New Delhi, and it was in English, and they couldn't read it, so, but it was about me. They knew it was about me for some reason. And they asked me to read it to them, to come down to the police station. Well, it was a warning circular from the government of India, and it said I was suspected of being a CIA agent. <laughs> <laughs> and they should watch me, you know, that they should watch my whereabouts. And so here I am in the police station in Kadgodi, reading this warning circuit, which is instructing the police to secretly watch me, you know, and my movements and my whereabouts and find out whether I'm really a spy from the CIA. So naturally, I didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> and... Um, I, I, and they said, well, what does it say? And I said, well, I said, it sort of says, well, I didn't know what to tell the police. And I said, well, they're sort of suspicious of me. And they said, oh, no problem, Mr. Howard. We know you. You're here for so many days. Uh, it's no problem. Don't worry. Don't worry. So I was uh, totally hysterical. And I ran over to the bungalow at Whitefield. And we had garden privileges in those days. So I ran into the garden. I didn't see Swami. It was about 8.30 in the morning before Darshan. So I went in the house and I looked for Swami because we could go in the house too. And he wasn't there. And I went around the back and he was back by the Gokulam. And I ran up to him and I was like, Swami. And he, he put his arm around me. It was really sweet. He said, what's the matter, sir? And I said, Swami. I said, the government of India thinks I'm a spy. <laughs> he said, don't worry, don't worry. He said, go sit in your place in the garden. I'll come. I'll see you. So I went in this place where I used to sit in the garden and meditate, and finally, after about two hours, he came out and called me over. He said, what's your problem, sir? And I said, Swami, I need a letter for my visa. And he said, he said what can I do, sir? He said, Indira Gandhi and Nixon, too much fighting. You know, this is like <laughs> 1972. And he said, go to Ceylon and come back. And I said, but Swami, I went to Ceylon last year, and I hated it there. <laughs> so he says, then go to America. He said, what can I do? So I got on my hands and knees and I said, please don't send me to America, Swami. Please don't send me to America. Please give me a letter. And he said, I don't give letters. He said, I never give any letters. And then I said, please, Swami. Then he lifted me up by my hands and he said, no, no, only some joke. He says, I don't give the letters. Kasturi gives the letters. <laughs> and for, I guess, anyone who doesn't know who Kasturi, Kasturi was the translator and the... Our good, our grand, our grandmother. Was our mother-in-law. Mother 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 so he told me, go to Puda party and tell Kasturi to give you a letter. So I said, Swami, Kasturi won't give me a letter unless you tell him to. He says, no, no, I'll telephone him. He said, go. And he lifted his robe a little bit over his feet. Let, he said, do. And I took Namaskar, went to Bangalore, cat, caught the afternoon SRS bus, you know, eight and a half hours. <laughs> You get to Puda party, it's like 9.30 at night, the light, there's a power failure, which was pretty typical in those days. I grope my way through the dark, and I find Mr. Kasturi hunched over a typewriter with a candle. And I come in, I'm all excited, I said, Mr. Kasturi, Mr. Kasturi, you have to give me a letter for my visa. And he says, what, what? I said, Swami said, you know, I tell him what happened. He said, well, Swami hasn't, he said, there's been a power failure here all day. Swami hasn't communicated anything to me. And, but I was so hysterical that he said that he would write this letter. And he said, well, what should I say? So I told him to write like a character reference, like they knew me and that I was doing my spiritual practice and I wasn't a spy for the CIA and all this kind of stuff. So he said, I'll, I'll write the letter and I'll put it in an envelope. And you 
give it to Swami. And if Swami approves it, then he'll give it back to you, you know, but I'll he addressed it to Swami. So then the next morning, early the next morning, back on that SRS bus, eight and a half hours to Bangalore, I get out to Whitefield, and as I get to Whitefield, Swami's already gone for the Joy Ice Cream Factory, and he's going to um, give his yearly blessing to the Joy Ice Cream Factory. So I'm walking down the road, and they told me that it was only the immediate family and some invited guests, and none of the foreigners were invited. So I'm walking down the road, and I figure I wait so outside the ice cream factory and try to give Swami the letter, you know, as he came out. But as I was walking down the road, the, the son of uh, Mr. Java, who owned the factory, drove up, stopped his car, and he said, are you going to the ice cream factory? And I said, yes. He said, come with me. And he drove me right in the gate, took me right there, sat me down in the front row. <laughs> And there I was, and Swami came out and sat on this throne on the platform, and he looks at me and he goes like this, writes in his hand, you know, and makes a sign, you know, like, like, did you get the letter? So I point to my pocket and show him the letter, and he goes, acha, you know, blessings. So I think Jerry Bass was sitting next to me, and Jerry says, you see, he approves of the letter, it's okay, he knows everything. Of course, we thought he knew everything, and so <laughs> I just assumed the letter was approved and everything was okay, and I felt so relieved. So I went off to the deputy superintendent of police in Bangalore, and I opened the envelope addressed to Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba, and I showed the du superintendent of police the letter. And then I had this funny feeling <laughs> that maybe I sh shouldn't give it to him, you know? And he said, well, this is all very well and good. He said, but I said, but I can't give it just now. I said, I feel like maybe I should get a just double check and make sure Sai Baba approves of this letter, you know? So he said, well, if you're going to do that, he said, if you're going to keep it, make two photostat copies. Now, they didn't even have Xerox machines in those days. They had <laughs> photostats. So he said, make two photostat copies for your own record. So I went to the, some place on Commercial Street, made the photostatic copies, and went back to Whitefield. And when I get back to Whitefield, Swami is now getting in his car to leave for Puda Party. So I'm on the driveway with the students, and I'm following Swami down the darshan line. He's about to go out the gate and give darshan. I'm saying, Swami, what about this letter? And I'm waving the letter. Oh, and he's going like this with his hands. He doesn't even look at me. And I say, well, what should I do with it? And he says, he turns around and says, you keep it. <laughs> so I thought, I didn't, I didn't feel good about it. It didn't feel right. Well, apparently what I found out later on is that he went in the house and he said, how can Kasturi give that man a letter without my permission after 25 years, you know? <laughs> and somebody phoned the ashram and tell Kasturi to leave. I don't want to see him there, you know? But luckily, <laughs> oh, luckily no. the phone was out, you know? Oh, but I didn't know all this, oh, you know? So I get back on that SRS bus, eight and a half hours back to Puda Party in hot pursuit, and I get off the bus and Mr. Kasturi's waiting. And he's just really, really upset. And he says, Where's that letter? Swami's really angry with me for giving you that letter. He says, I should have never given it to you. I don't know why I listened to you, you know. He said, give me back that letter. So I didn't want to tell him that I had made two copies. Because that would have been the worst thing I could have done at that point. You know? So I gave him the original, and I stuck the two copies in my trunk. And we were all staying in the shed, because the whole ashram was being constructed. So that was it, you know, for, for momentarily. <laughs> um, Swami said he was, was, you know, Swami was sort of ignoring me, but we all got into the construction. And the Bangalore DSP's office, Deputy Superintendent of Police, they gave me a three-month extension because they, they wanted to watch me. And so I had to be there, you know, to watch. <laughs> so they gave me the three-month extension anyway, you know, even though the government had said, you know, um, that I was maybe a spy. So... I figured, you know, I, I just got busy doing the construction work, but at the end of the three months, I thought, well, maybe that was all just a big test, you know? <laughs> and since Swami had promised me the letter back on Christmas Day, 71, that I would try again <laughs> and ask him again. So I finally got to where he would give me some attention in the Darshan line one day, and I said, Swami, I need a letter for my visa. He said, go to Bangalore and try. Went to Bangalore, I said, no, you have to have a letter from the ashram to extend beyond six months. So Swami was just ignoring me and he wouldn't come near me. So they were building the new canteen in 72 and the building had at that point a corrugated tin roof, cinder block walls and a dirt floor and it was very long and it was divided into compartments. 
So I went about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I hid in there because I knew he was going to come walking through on an inspection tour. And I hid behind the door and I could see through the crack, you know, in the door that Swami was talking to some people. And then he came through the door, you know, and I jumped out at him from behind the door and I said, Swami, and he's looking up at the ceiling and he's going and he's looking at the construction and he's going like this totally and I said it louder, Swami. And then finally I said, Mother. And then he turned around and said, What? <laughs> and I said, I said, Swami, I need a letter for my visa. He said, Go tell Kasturi. <laughs> and I said, But Swami. <laughs> I said, But Swami, last time I told Mr. Kasturi, you yelled at him. <laughs> and he pulled his hair like this and he wrote and he said, Oh, he said, then I will tell today night. You know? <laughs> so, of course, that night he called Kasturi to his room as he did every night and he told him, don't recommend that man. He's completely, <laughs> completely crazy, you know? <laughs> so when Mr. Kasturi came and told me that, you know, I just wanted to stay at his lotus feet forever. I was just so intoxicated with Swami and he was the most beautiful, wonderful thing in the world. And I just couldn't hear that news, you know, that it was like over. And I went up on the hill and I was praying and crying and I was going through probably, you know, what, like this whole catharsis, scream, primal screaming, whatever it was. <laughs> and suddenly a light went on in my head and I said, well, if I show him the copy of the letter, then he'll see that it's just a simple little letter. It's such a simple little inoffensive letter that he can't possibly be mad you know <laughs> so the very next day i go down to my hiding place in the canteen <laughs> i hide behind the door oh. three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon swami comes through for the inspection tour i jump out at him with the letter ready and i said swami this is the letter i need and he takes it and he reads and he looks at this he says where did you get this and i said swami this is a copy of that letter Mr. Castorio, he says, no, no, this is illegal. <laughs> and he left, and he went, and he called Castori oh, that no. night. <laughs> no. Every evening, Castori went for the oh, daily reports on the Mr. ashram. Kasturi. And he told, he scolded Mr. Castori, and he told poor Mr. Castori that I had made, I have, was probably making 20 forgeries of the letter to give to every foreigner so they could all get the visas. And that he had to go and find me and confiscate all those forgeries, you know. <laughs> And that it was all Mr. Castori's fault for giving me the letter. <laughs> he, you know, so Mr. Castori comes to this shed, you know, and he wants the forgeries. And I, I pull out these photostats and I said, Mr. Castori, they're not. I said, doesn't Swami know the difference between a forgery and a photostat? And he was so upset. He said, how can he know that? He's only from a village. <laughs> so he took the letters, the copies, the photostats, and he went back. And I wrote Swami a long letter of apology. And the next day, Swami gave out the booty to everybody in the ashram. You know, he comes with this all these volunteers and workers and he comes with those little plastic bags of babuti he's giving everybody and somehow he managed to skip me i was the only one in the ashram that didn't get babuti and i i just realized that i had to go you know it was just very very sad so i went back to the dsp in bangalore deputy superintendent of police and i said well i have to get an exit permit and leave because i couldn't get the other says why don't you go to New Delhi and try? <laughs> so he said, maybe in New Delhi. So I get on a plane and I go to New Delhi, just like that. I left all my clothes, everything in Whitefield. That just went straight from Bangalore to the airport, caught the flight to Delhi. Get to New Delhi and I go see the, um, I, I decided I'd go, I'd go to the center, which was at um, this lady, Mrs. Sundar Singh's house. And I walked in there and this um, man who was the vice president of the, organization in Delhi in those days and he was quite a wealthy Indian and he had um, some connections he had lobbyists so I told him the story of what was going on that I needed the letter so he got me connected with this lobbyist who took me around in his car and he took me to this restricted military base <laughs> so to give a letter uh, asking Indira Gandhi herself to recommend me for a visa. So, uh, because Indira Gandhi's secretary was gonna take off from this military place in the helicopter with papers for Mrs. Gandhi to sign. And then he said, we'll give you a letter and they'll take it. So I closed my eyes like this because when, they, when I, I remember passing through the sign that said restricted area military personnel only. And I thought, well, here they are accusing me of being a spy, but they're taking me in a chauffeur car to the restricted military base. So I better close my eyes because I don't want them to accuse me. So the guy, the lobbyist thought I was completely crazy.
crazy because I'm riding in the car like this and I'm giving the letter to Mrs. Gandhi's secretary. And I said, you mean that they're going to fly my letter, especially in a helicopter to Mrs. Gandhi? And he said, no, silly boy, they have other important work. He's just doing it as a favor, you know? <laughs> so the police, meanwhile, the police in Delhi gave me till midnight to hear from Mrs. Gandhi. And then they had my ticket booked. They had the escort all set up. They were going to take me to the airport. And Mrs. Gandhi replied at about 11.55, that she didn't get involved, it was up to the Ministry of Home Affairs, and they escorted me, the police escorted me to the airport, they put me on the Air India flight, they made sure I had a seat, and they shut the door of the plane and got me out of India. And I like, you know, 20 hours later, I was in Manhattan, and it was all like a dream. <laughs> uh, boy. And, oh, but that was just one of many stories. <laughs> oh, boy. So I lied and I cheated, <laughs> and I opened Baba's mail, but no. he forgave me. Oh, yeah. He jumped out of hiding places. Oh, <laughs> jumped out of hiding places. <laughs> oh, Sai Ram. I have a, a question. I, I don't know whether other people would answer it, but, um, you know, in, in the Sai Baba's fairly renowned for his ability to materialize things, and... You know, people often wonder why or ask why, but I mean, maybe sometimes where he did unusual things for various reasons and or effects. And the one I remember is he often, we used to have interviews before lunch and um, I have a high metabolism. And when I was like 20, my metabolism was fierce. And I used to be able to eat like three full meals before noon because I was just like a morning person. I'd be up early and starving. And if I didn't have food, I'd just like start going bananas. And... Uh, so when Swami pulled us into interviews before lunch, it was always difficult for me because, like, I was so hungry. So I just remember one time being in an interview, and he's talking along and all that, and I was really hungry, and my mind started wandering, and I was sort of thinking, I mean, it's hard, you know, like, when's this going to get over so we can get <laughs> some lunch <laughs> and stuff? And he just, he looks up at me, and he goes, he just materializes some um, food, some sweets, and passes it out and says, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just so, subtle. Yeah. yeah. It's the subtle things that Swami did. It's not always the words. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, I'll tell that, that one Ahimsa story because it's really nice. Uh, I, I, uh, I st already started working in this garden, and, and Amos, uh, Vicky's husband, handed me a book of his Baba's speeches. I think it was volume four, but I'm not sure. And I opened it up just like you'd, some people open up the Bible and just the first thing you read. And first thing I ever read was, if you take a leaf from a tree with no reason, it gives God pain. And so that made me all of a sudden feel responsible for the ants. <laughs> 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 you know, walking in our bare feet. So I be, actually, it was wonderful because I, I looked for this you know, I don't know if you remember in Whitefield, but the small ants, they didn't walk mm. in lines. They were just scattered all over. <laughs> so here I was trying to not tiptoe through life, but <laughs> looking right in front of my toes. And actually, it was a wonderful meditation because you really had to see what was going on right in front of your toes. And um, <laughs> combined, it, combined it with a, uh, actually a, a melody that came to me in the garden. Uh, which I never shared. I started to hum it once in an interview, and Baba looked at me like this. So I've never shared it since. But I combined it with a melody and a prayer, when the prayer was from my heart. And it was just wonderful. But one day I was walking like that, looking just for the ants. And Roger Reddy said, uh, why are you walking like that? And I said, I'm trying not to kill the ants. And he laughed, and he said, God doesn't care about ants. Well, I don't know if you guys remember, but two days later or so, maybe the next day, we were in an interview with Baba, and he was sitting in his chair, and he was talking to us, and suddenly he stopped talking, and he reached over with his finger, and he took this little hand off his shoulder, and I don't know if he materialized it or not. He took this little hand off his shoulder, and he bent down, and he blew it on the ground, and he sat up, and he looked me in the eyes, and he smiled. Hmm. And he said what? <laughs> he just smiled. Nice. Just smiled. Yeah. yeah it was nice. That's so typical. Yeah. I would say, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Just subtle stuff. He lets you happens. know. He lets you know what you're thinking, what you wanted, what you want. What... How many years has it been since most of you've been back? And what is it that Swami did or said to sustain you in these years? How have you thought about him? How do you think he carried through? Well, yeah, it's been a long time. It's been 20, 
three years, right? For you, <laughs> twenty-three yeah. years. But wow. it, it, I, how I ended up in India in the first place was kind of like a, an amazing story in the, in, to begin with. So this is as amazing as his. <laughs> and uh, so not, not, not more amazing. I hope. <laughs> not, <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's the men, it's not the women. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, we've been before this camera came on, we were kidding. But anyway, um, so to me. To me, it's, it's like you were saying yesterday. He said he was my mother, father, whatever. I believed it, <laughs> and I feel that. You know, I mean, it's like so. It's everywhere, and I don't feel an an an, an, an unnecessary urge to be there necessarily. Although I think I will be at some point. But it is my he changed my life a lot, really, in the sense that I think that uh, it's really everywhere here now. And uh, I don't feel a, a strong necessity to, uh, to be there. But actually, this last few days have been very, uh, you know, filled with, uh, it's almost like there was no time separated, you know? <laughs> time vanished in between. Oh, I mean, it's 23 years, but it doesn't seem like anything. Mm -hmm. Sitting here right now, it's like nothing. It's a bit of, I, Although I don't remember anything about what Howard's been talking about in the last three days. I don't remember any of these incidents. He made but it still, up. Yeah, I think he's making it up. But still, no time has but it's gone. it's good. And that's in a way, and then I look at the, the, the film that he has made about Sai Baba just mm. last year, and he looks exactly the same. He acts exactly the same. He's still a child. He still is like, everything is fresh. It's brand new. And that's a joy to see. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, That's totally an extraordinary. That's huh? totally extraordinary yeah. that everything is just still fresh and brand new for Swami. And in, in, in then and then, I always think everything, many things are amazing. But the fact that he always had a new line, a new thing. He kept doing these things where he changed languages. And he would write something out in one language. It's hard to describe, but the, like a, a command of the seed sounds and a command of languages that's... Mm -hmm. Not like anything, anyone at all I've ever heard. And I swear that sometimes he could come along and say something to the Darsh online. There would be like ten people. Three different people heard three different things, which each one of them was like a a revelation to them, you know. And, and then, and but what he actually said, I you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce. Well, you know, I when I left. I was happy to leave. I'm, well, I wasn't happy, happy, but I mean, I really felt as though I'd been there as long as I should be. It was painful to leave, actually, but, um, and I never felt the urge to go back. I never did. And I think part of the reason of it is, for me, it was, it was probably, or not probably, it was one of the great formative things in my life, but it became so evident that it, at least how I felt about it, was that it made no sense to be running back and forth to India, sitting in line looking at him, that the job was to live a life, you know, and that sounds so simple, but I mean, to try to live a really good life. And it, it's sort of like, he, it was a bit of a school, and it's a school that you graduate from, and then you go out and you do your work, and you work, learn from work, and it's not that you necessarily stay in the school that particular school all your time so um, I just never really thought it was necessary to go back because there was enough going on there to keep you going for a lifetime in in a way and I, I did go back uh, about four years ago and uh, and the thing that struck me was on a, on a very sort of material plane but I mean Sai Baba was born in a very tiny village in the middle of God but Jesus, nowhere. I mean, Puta Party was so remote uh, at the time of his birth and, and, and things. And when we got there, it was like badlands, is just how I describe it. I mean, just really, you know, it the, desert. It was like, the, it was and, like uh, the hills of Kentucky or something. It was like as remote uh, as like some... Yeah, but I mean, really backwards. unfertile and hot. Oh, yeah, it was very... And hot. when I went back, um, as you started approaching Puta Party, um, there were forests that had been planted. And the... Mm and they were growing up and the climate was changing. <laughs> when we were there, it was just, you know, like rocks and sand and, you had to and, leave and crows. It was like 130 degrees. Mm -hmm. 
And with all the forests that had been planted, the climate was changing. You saw like all sorts of kinds of birds that had never been there before. And this was a part of India that had been deforested several centuries before. It wasn't naturally a, a bad land. It had been abused and made into one. And to see that on top of all the other things that he does on a personal level, that like he was working so ardently to recreate the health and beauty of the place where he was born and the breadth of vision and, and the amount of coordination that it takes to do that. I was just absolutely astounded because I'd never seen a place on the planet where the climate had been transformed and that's basically um, been accomplished there. So I, I really thought that was the most striking thing. Martin? How long has it been since you've been back? The last time I was in India was uh, 1981, so that's 15 years ago. I was just coming from the Far East back to England, and I thought, I'm here, I'll stop in India. I'll go see Sai Baba, but just for a week or two weeks. I landed in Bombay, and it was the marriage season, and I couldn't get a bus, I couldn't get a train, I couldn't get a plane for at least three weeks. It was just impossible to get out of Bombay. And I was really fed up about that. Then, after a couple of days, I heard Sai Baba's coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I go out to the suburb where he has his center, which I'd never been there before. And I just, I heard he's coming, so I get on, on, on the bus and I went. And I get off the bus, Sai Baba drives past in his car. I stand there. He drives past. That is enough. I knew that I had nothing to say. I didn't, you know, he was, he was with me. I'd had a very intense experience. He was with me. And that was enough. And for me, for the time being, that is enough. Uh, I hope to go back soon, perhaps with my son. Uh, that, I think, would be uh, a new experience and uh, something I, I could value very much. How about you, Robert? 1979. I went back 72, 75, 79. Went back after my parents were killed in 75. I, about the middle 80s, I, I um, expected, I planned to go back, told everyone I was going back, and I had real signs not to go back, and so I didn't. And now I'm just sort of waiting around, seeing what happens next. I, uh, I feel him in my life a lot, actually. I've, I've had some real miraculous, I mean, sometimes it just hits you over the head. But I, I just feel him a lot, so I, I, I'd love to see him. But I'm not sure about all the crowds that I hear about. But uh, it's, it's, no, it's not impossible not to see him either. It's, it's, it's okay to be here. For me, it's been 10 years now, this, this very June, 10 years since I've been back. And, and um, just sitting here and talking about the stories, and it just feels like it just happened a moment ago, because for me, everything's always been so fresh in my mind. And the 16-year period that I went back and forth to Swami's from 1970 to 1986, it seems everything has just always remained very vivid. Um, I was there, the last time I was there was 1986 to work in the planetarium and I was there for seven months and I had a lot of wonderful times and, and chances with, with Swami and um, it was just very beautiful and it filled me up so much that I had not, I have not had the desire to go back until very recently, in fact until this very year is when I've been starting to thinking about going back and, I, and my goal is to get back for his 75th birthday in the year 2000 in the big world conference. So hope that I'll make it. Not after this tape. <laughs> <laughs> Probably they'll never let me in, right? <laughs> I won't ask for any letters, I promise. <laughs> let me just tell you one little short story about um, how, as I always describe it, I felt like the straight man in a comedy routine, and I said my line quite perfectly, perfectly timed. Um, I was doing these paintings at Anantapur. He would come up, spend some time, and uh, there had been an event, which is too long to go into, but someone had come up and laid this real heavy rap on me, <laughs> gone all the way out of their way from Whitefield to come up and lay this rap on me, and it just disturbed my mind in Anantapur. This was several hundred miles. And uh, he came, it had been three days later he came, and as he came to the 
to the college building as it was being built, he walked past me and went, wind, no wind, no wind, no wind, no wind. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he didn't say much more. It was late, pretty late at night. He went some, I don't know where he stayed early, someone's house, and came back the next day and came with a real stern kind of, go up to your room, I'm coming up to talk to you. And um, so I went up to my room, and he came in with a couple of people I didn't know, and laughed and said, his, his mind is like a monkey, and laughed at me, and which was like, you know, complete setup, and it changed the whole vibe. He came over, and he sat on my sleeping bag, which Dying Dog had been lying on. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't know Dying Dog, we won't go into that, but, but, <laughs> the name's explanatory. Yeah, it's, yes. it's explanatory, self-explanatory. Good, Good old Dying Dog. <laughs> and, uh, and so we sat there, and, and he, he materialized some rings and talked to the other two guys for a while. And then he said, uh, don't let the bad thoughts in. And I said, well, how do you know the good thoughts and the bad thoughts? And he said, you know, you know. And then he turned to the other two guys and he, he made a face and went, his mind's like this. And, he went, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no, it's worse than that. And he said, see, you know. And it just literally struck me like, you know, a bolt right in the head. And it was obvious. Of course I knew. And frequently I thought it was like that, you know, you... You were literally a straight man in the, in the routine, as long as you allowed yourself to be, if you were really free. And if you really expressed your doubts, I thought it was important that you expressed your doubts. If, you, if you're going along, oh, we've got a friend here. I don't know if you can see her in the well, background. Interested in the person. <laughs> don't get up, you guys. But, uh, what is it? What is it? She wants to be in the film. Jordan. <laughs> no, Jordan's going to bark at him. But, no. Uh, Jordan, no. If you expressed, if you expressed your doubts, then then it could be wiped away. But if you, you know, said yes, 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 and then while your mind was going no, 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 then, you know, what do you expect? That's what I felt. So I always tried to come out with as big a doubts as I could come up with, but sometimes they were kind of hard, <laughs> kind of hard. Um, well, he, yeah. used, he used to often ask in the interviews, he'd say, any doubts, you know, and people would sit there like frozen, but <laughs> he really wanted us to express these doubts because he, he could clear them up for us. And um, Yeah, I don't think it's necessary to bring this, you know, so much reverence or whatever, that, especially if it's not really coming from your heart, if it's just some kind of <clears throat> front. Yeah. Although I think that it's not, it'd be very difficult not to have something happening to you. For everyone that's seeing on, see him on film or whatever, I've never been in his presence. I don't think you can walk in and just say, oh yeah, that, that's nice meeting you. I mean, something's going to happen to you. Some kind of change in your own experience of yourself and of what your actual heart is doing. Every time I ever saw him, it was, there was something going on in me, whether it was just something saying, I remember the first time I met him, after an interview, and there was a small group, about seven of us, and he took me back behind the curtain, which was the stairway, and he stood on the second step, and that's the first time I realized he was very short, yeah. and stood on the second step and hugged me. Mm. And what I remember was there was something left, the only thing left was something saying, let go, let go, let go, <laughs> you know, and, and then he asked me, what do I want? And I said, what do you want? And he said, it's my, I don't need anything. It's my job to give you what you want. One time, um, <clears throat> Swami said that, um, so somebody asked Swami why we had so many bad thoughts and doubts. And he said that, he said, you see, your heart is like a garden. And he said, God's grace is like the rain. And when it rains, not only do beautiful flowers and, and herbs and fruits come in the garden, but also weeds come in the garden. And the weeds are like your bad thoughts and doubts. And you have to pull the weeds out with the discipline of your spiritual practice so that the flowers and the fruits may blossom. You know, the flowers and fruits of love and devotion and faith and surrender. And I thought that was a very beautiful lesson, which is I've always thought about in those years um, when I struggled with, with those things. Right, Martin? Yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>